I'm going to start today's video off with a controversial statement. The place that we're looking at today was plundered and looted by other countries. They took the artifacts back to their own country, and it was probably the best thing that has happened to those artifacts. Now, I know what you're thinking. You would never hear an archaeologist say that, and typically I wouldn't. I honestly think that all artifacts need to stay where they're at. But unfortunately, recently, terrorism has been a big issue when it comes to artifacts, especially in Iraq. The ancient city of Kala, modern-day Nimrud, was recently destroyed by terrorists. We're going to get into more detail here in a little bit why I think the artifacts being taken by other countries was probably a good thing. But let's talk about the ancient city of Kala, and it all starts with Mesopotamia. That's where we see the first civilizations come about. It was located in southwestern Asia, and it includes parts of Syria, Turkey, and Iraq. It got its name from the ancient Greeks, meaning between rivers. And those rivers are the Tigris and the Euphrates. Mesopotamia gave us a lot of things that we can't live without today, like writing that you can use to leave a comment below. They also gave us the wheel, like, you know, the wheel in your mouse where you can scroll down so you can hit the subscribe button. They gave us the 24-hour clock that we're constantly depressed by because we're just shoved into some small office where we make money for other people that don't need any more money, and they decide that we're there for a certain number of time and we don't get to do what we actually want to do. But they also gave us beer, which is used responsibly can help us forget about the fact that we're taking and making somebody else richer while we're getting poor. They also developed the concept of civil rights, which we still struggle with to this day because just being decent and giving people rights is way too much to ask, even for most modern countries. So now that we're all sufficiently either sad, angry, upset, or all the above, let's take and talk more about Mesopotamia. The first archaeological evidence that we have of people deciding they're going to settle down there comes from about 10,000 BCE. They they started off just farming and domesticating animals, but soon they started to grow and they started to trade with others around them, and their little villages started to become full-blown cities. We call this time that they started to settle down and domesticate animals and farm, the agricultural revolution, and it brought us many great things, but none more so than the specialization in specific skills. As the people started to be able to settle down and no longer had to worry about chasing their food, they were able to start to branch out and chase their passion. And in Mesopotamia, they actually put a lot of stock into intellectual pursuits, and because of the specialization and the intellectual pursuits, we actually get the world's oldest written story, the Epic of Gilgamesh. And it was a good thing that they put a lot of emphasis on intellectual pursuits, because with over a thousand deities, you would have to take and spend your lifetime just trying to remember them all. And because people needed to eat, both men and women would work in the fields. This hasn't changed a whole lot to this day. The only difference is now we sit in cubicles farming money for somebody else that doesn't really need it. Women also had more rights than most countries just recently decided that they deserved. They were able to file for divorce. They could own their own land and businesses. They could even make contracts for trade agreements. So how were their cities set up? They built their cities around what was called a ziggurat. It was a stepped pyramid. And if you want to know more about that, go check out the video I made on the Hanging Gardens and whether they existed or not. Their buildings were mostly made out of mud brick. They got the mud from the riverbanks, and then they would use the reeds to help build their houses. They mainly constructed two types of houses. The first was a basic house. It was made of reeds that were lashed together and just stuck into the ground. And the other type of house was made of sun-dried bricks. Now that we have the basics in the Mesopotamian society out of the way, let's look at the Assyrians and how they eventually came to create the city of Kali. The Assyrian Empire started off sometime during the second millennium BCE and is considered to be one of the world's first empires. And their history can be broken down into three time periods. The Old Kingdom, or the Old Assyrian period, the Middle Empire, and the Late Empire, otherwise known as the Neo-Assyrian Empire. And why they chose to flip-flop on names so much, I really don't know. The Old Kingdom or period, whichever way you choose to call it, started sometime around 2000 BCE and ended at around 1600 BCE. It was during this periodum, that's what I'm going to call it, that we actually see the first distinct signs of the Assyrian culture. Before we could talk about the city of Kali, we actually need to talk about another important city that the Assyrians made, the city of Azure. The city was founded around 1000 1900 BCE, but there's evidence of people living in the area as far back as 2500 BCE. From inscriptions that they left behind, we believe that their first king was a guy named Tudea. The next set of kings were just referred to as kings who lived in tents. This suggests that they didn't have a hard and defined city. That would come later. Instead, they were just pastoral peoples. Once they became a city, they flourished, and they were even considered a commercial center. That was until a man named Hammurabi of Babylon conquered the city. The city, in large part, had made its wealth by trading with Anatolia. But when Babylon took 
took over, they changed the trade routes to go through them instead of going through Azure. This forced Azure to have to trade directly with Babylon, and it actually caused the city to suffer because of this. Then in 1750 BCE, Hammurabi died, and the stability he had brought with him disappeared as well. The region would erupt in civil war, with each city-state trying to come out on top. The Assyrians would eventually win, but it was too little too late. By the time the civil wars were over, the kingdom of Mitanni had risen out of western Anatolia, and Azure once again found itself under somebody else's rule. This brings us to the Middle Empire, between 1365 BCE and 609 BCE. By this time, the kingdom of Mitanni had become weak, and they were eventually replaced by the Hittites. Eventually, an Assyrian king named Azure Uballit I would conquer the lands around him, going as far as to conquer Nineveh and Arbella, thus giving us the first glimpse at the true Assyrian Empire. Uballit may have been the one that lit the spark for the Assyrian Empire, but it was the dad Nirari I that actually took and made the fire grow. Nirari expanded the empire all the way to the Euphrates and up to the Hittite borders, and because of nepotism, his son Shalmaneser I took over the throne after Nirari's death. <laughs> Shalmaneser continued his father's expansion of the empire, and he's the one that's credited with founding the city of Kali, otherwise known as Nimrud. But even though he founded the city, it wasn't considered an important place until hundreds of years later. Ajinashapal II was the one that seen Kali as being a place that he could actually make a capital of. And most of the information we have about him actually comes from the temple ruins at Kali. But before he could make it his new capital, he had to fix it up first. It had been left just to sit and rot for years. But before he could even do that, he had a lot of busy work that he had to do. And by busy work, I mean more bloody work than anything. He had to go around the empire, putting down rebellions all over the place. He also restructured the way the provinces were set up, and much like a mob boss, he would go out and meet with the officials to take and collect his tribute. But for one of the rebellions, he sent a very strong message to anybody else that would try to rebel. He took the rebel leader and had them filleted. This brought an end to that rebellion pretty quickly. And if you remember, I said the city was in ruins. From the campaigns that he led, he took the captives and forced them to rebuild the city. He forced them to construct his new palace, as well as a temple to the god Ninurta, who was originally the god of springtime thunderstorms and plowing. He eventually became the god of war because apparently every culture needs one. He also forced them to construct a temple to the god Anil, who was considered to be the highest god in their pantheon, and he was the god of many different things. He represented hurricanes all the way down to a gentle spring wind. Eventually the Babylonians would replace him with Marduk. There were also several shrines that were constructed, along with the city wall. He also had them lay out the plans for a botanic garden and a zoological garden. This is considered to be the first of its kind, so I guess Escobar has him to thank for this. And finally, in 879 BCE, he was able to take and move to his new capital. And the city was massive. It was around 360 hectares, or about 504 football pitches. The wall that ran around the city was 7.5 kilometers long. And you would think, it's a hot new place. People would want to move there. Well, when people are comfortable, they tend not to want to move. So he actually moved around 16,000 people to the new city. And to break in the new city, he threw a massive housewarming party. The party lasted for 10 days, and he commemorated it with a special steel called the Banquet Steel. The Banquet Steel says that there was around 69,574 people that showed up to party. And it even recorded the meals, and he brought enough for the whole class. There were 1,000 oxen, 1,000 sheep and cattle, 14,000 fattened sheep, 1,000 lambs, 500 game birds, 500 gazelles, 10,000 fish, 10,000 eggs, 10,000 loaves of bread, 10,000 measures of beer, and I don't know what a measure is, but if you do, let me know in the comments below. And he also had 10,000 containers of wine brought in. Hmm. When the party was all said and done, he let everybody go, but not before holding the dignitaries back. Do you remember those campaigns that I told you about earlier? Well, he had those carved in relief form in his new temple, and he took the dignitaries to the temple to show them these reliefs. And the message that he was sending was pretty clear. Disobey me and you will suffer. Kli would remain the Assyrian capital for the next 173 years. In 706 BCE, Sargon II decided he was going to make his own capital. The Assyrian Empire would fall pretty quickly after this. By 612 BCE, Kli, Azure and Nineveh were all burned down by a joint effort between the Persians, the Medes, and the Babylonians. The city of Kli was never rebuilt, instead it was just left to rot yet again. It wasn't until some 2,000 years later when a man from the British East India Company visited the site and wrote about it. This caught the attention of the archaeologist Austin Henry Laird. He started excavations at the site in 1845, and he originally thought that he had found the city of Nineveh. He even wrote a best-selling book about it.
His book started a slew of people flooding to the area, trying to find other cities from the Old Testament. It wasn't too long after this that he actually realized that he didn't find Nineveh, he actually found the ancient city of Kli. During the excavations carried out by Laird and Razum, they found the Northwest Palace and several temples. Then in 1854, the excavations were taken over by William K. Loftus. He's the one that unearthed what are called the Nimrod Ivories. Then in 1952, the Nimrod letters were found. The letters were found in the palace. They're royal letters that are from different reigns of the Assyrian Empire. There were over 300 letters recovered, most of them royal correspondence. When they found the letters, they were unbaked, so they were in danger of being ruined. Archaeologists decided to make a crude furnace right there to bake the letters. Even though they tried to preserve the letters, they still managed to take and destroy some of them. And why did they do something that could be so dangerous for the artifacts? Their dig season was coming to an end. They only had two or three weeks left, so they had to do something really quick, or the clay tablets may not have survived. Out of over 300 tablets, the Director General of Antiquities of the Government of Iraq allowed them to keep 52 of them to take back to the British Museum. The site of Nimrud has never been fully excavated, and it doesn't look like it's going to be anytime soon either. And this is where the controversial statement that I made at the beginning of the video comes back. In the past, archaeologists would just claim items and have them sent back to their home country. This is frowned upon now, rightfully so. If a country has the ability to keep the artifacts safe, then those artifacts belong to that country and they should be returned. But the argument could be made that by taking these artifacts and sending them back to countries around the world. It actually preserved the artifacts. Because recently ISIS has destroyed Nimrud, and they did this because of idol worship. Now back in their day, they didn't know that Nimrud was going to be destroyed by ISIS. They were just taking to take. Colonization has led to a lot of problems around the world, a lot of cultures losing their culture, and archaeologists are a big factor to this. But it's something that we're working to change. I want to thank you all for watching, and I want to thank my crew over at Patreon for helping choose the topic for this video. If you want to help choose the next topic, or get exclusive content like my Too Hot for YouTube shorts. But in 1726, doctors were taken for a f loop when a lady named Mary Toft started giving birth to animal parts. Then head over to Patreon and for as little as two Canadian dollars a month, you can help support the channel.